chapter 24, PowerPoint number 2. Here we go again. The Republicans retain control of Congress and becomes very pro-business. As a matter of fact, lobby lobbyists are dominating the National Republican Party and they're calling for the government to lower the tax on individuals and businesses, keep the tariffs high, and enforce the anti-union campaigns. The president appoints pro-businessmen to the Federation, the federal government and the Reserve Board, and the government issues injunctions to start halting strikes. The Supreme Court's become very, very conservative, and of course, former President Taft has become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and that's what he always wanted. He didn't like being president, and he returns it to the old days that fair government hands off of business. He even strikes down a minimum wage law for women in the District of Columbia unconstitutional. But the administration, or shall we say the lackluster President Warren G. Harding, became one of the most corrupt in the nation's history. And although his cabinet did have a few good men <coughs> with talent and integrity, like Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes and Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, Harding appointed his friends and cronies, and, and they used their offices for private gain. There was several corruption scandals involving a leasing of the most famous leasing of governor oil reserves to businessmen at Teapot Dome, Wyoming, and that's called the Teapot Dome Affair. The uh, Secretary of the Interior received $500,000 for his services, and he came, became the first cabinet member in history to receive a felony conviction. And they had the Veterans Bureau cheated uh, disabled veterans of $200 million. The Attorney General took bribes for pardons. It was <laughs> a scandal ridden and made you very ashamed to be an American. But it wasn't Hardy's fault. He was a good old boy. He just thought he ought to repay favors and appoint people to jobs that they had no qualifications for. The only thing that saved him from being impeached and going to jail was the fact he died in office. And his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, became president. Now, of course, Calvin Coolidge, uh, he won fame as Massachusetts governor for using state troops to end the Bostonian policeman strike back in 1919. Very uncharismatic, but compared to President Harding, he would seem like an honest Yankee. He continued Harding's policies without the corruption and scandal, and in 1924, he won re-election by a rather huge margin. He defeated a Democratic candidate called John Davis, a Wall Street lawyer who had been nominated by a very badly divided Democratic Party. He won six of the electoral votes in 1924, went for Robert LaFolliette, the Candidate of a new progressive party whose platform called for higher taxes on the wealthy, public ownership of railroads, farm relief, a ban on child labor. This sounds an awful lot like the um, People's Party, doesn't it? He described the progressive platform as a plan for a... Coolidge described the progressive platform as a plan for communists and socialists. The Lafayette won the endorsement of progressives like Jane Addams and the American Federation of Labor. But he raised very little money, and he really only carried Wisconsin. But his candidacy did show that discontent was persisting under the surface of prosperity and conservatism. He's quite the guy. Foreign affairs also reflected the alliance between business and government. And during this decade, we saw a retreat from Wilsonian internationalism toward in unilateral American actions mostly intended to boost exports and investment opportunities abroad. We became almost isolationist. We wanted to be internationalists in trade, but isolationists in policy. But the so-called isolation was really a reaction against the disappointments over Wilson's aggressive military and diplomatic stance. The United States hosted a naval arms conference in Washington in 1922, which actually managed to secure navies, smaller navies from Britain, France, Japan, Italy, and us. But the country stayed outside the League of Nations, and it did raise tariffs to the highest levels in history, which repudiated Wilson's commitment to free trade. Now, this arms conference was held. They were trying to prevent another war. And we could see that the navies of Japan and Britain, they're starting to build up again. So we got to call a halt to it. We had emerged from World War One as the world's major manufacturing producer and the fin biggest financial power. 
and private developments are going on in policy and, and influencing the government more so than the actual government officials. New York bankers made huge loans to Europe and Latin American country governments, sometimes alone and sometimes with help from the administration. The American industrial firms, especially in auto, agriculture, machinery, and electrical equipment, they established overseas plants to supply the world market and to find cheaper labor. American investors gained control over raw materials things like copper in Chile and oil in Venezuela. When American economic interests seem threatened, the government sends in the troops, invading once more in Nicaragua to suppress a nationalist revolt to protect American businesses. Wartime and post-war repression, prohibition and pro-business policies in wartime in the 1920s damaged progressive belief that the federal government could represent national purposes and enhance freedom. Progressive began to gain a new appreciation of civil liberties, rights that an individual may assert even against democratic majorities. This was a fundamental feature of American freedom. And reformers now encourage open and democratic debate and in the 1920s, uh, a coherent concept of civil liberties and legal protection for freedom of speech against the government began to emerge. But wartime and post-war repression persisted into the 1920s. Lynchings continued, and people endorsing free speech or radical doctrines were arrested and attacked by authorities and private citizens. And government agencies such as the Postal and Customs Service began to censor books that they considered obscene. A watch and ward committee in Boston excluded dozens of books from the bookstore, including works of the novelist Upton St. Clair and Theodore Dreiser and Ernest Hemingway and banned in Boston, you know. Movie producers feared that scandals involving their actors might reinforce beliefs that the movies promoted immorality. And in 1922, the film industry adopted the Hayes Code, which barred films from depicting nudity, adultery, and long kisses. And only in 1951 would the Supreme Court offer First Amendment protection for some of the films. Like I said, Mr. Taft, who's always wanted to be Supreme Court judge, finally made it. It was under his tutelage that the American Civil Liberties Union was formed, which basically invented the right to privacy. It actually began as a coalition of pacifists, progressives, and lawyers. They were outraged by the violation of Americans' rights by the government during the war. But the court did little to protect the rights of unpopular minorities. Initially, the court itself restricted civil liberties, and in 1919, the court upheld the constitutionality of the Espionage Act and the conviction of a socialist who would send anti-draft leaflets through the mails. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes spoke for the court when he declared that the First Amendment did not prevent Congress from publishing speeches that presented a, from prohibiting speech that presented a clear and present danger, like you can't yell fire in a crowded room. Uh, this became the basis of the Supreme Court's decision in future court, uh, the cases, but since it allowed public officials to determine what kind of speech was dangerous, it was kind of an arbitrary doctrine. Now, sensationalism is, going to, sensationalism is going to be selling more papers than, you know, who wants to read good news? And when it was proven that a murder trial in Chicago got more play than the election, well, the papers started paying more attention. Now, this next little story I'm going to tell you is not in the text. That's Lloyd Collins. It seems that we had a reporter who was working for one of the Lexington newspapers was on vacation. And uh, he was down around Mammoth Cave and was driving along. He's driving along the road one day and he sees two men standing outside a cave by a fire warming their hands. And he thought it was kind of strange, so he stopped and asked him what was going on. Well, it seems their friend, Floyd Collins, had been looking for a cave to explore so that he could make some money. And he'd gone into this little cave that no one knew about. And while he was, you know, a couple hundred feet down there, there was a rock slide and he was pinned in. And they were warming their hands, trying to get warm to go back in to try to get him out. He had his pen rocks were pinned, his foot was pinned under rocks. And the passage was steep and narrow, and he couldn't get out. But like I said, he had three fins there, and Mr. Miller, the newspaper man, 
He said, well, that's, that's, this is me interesting. He's a human interest story. So he wrote up the story. He sent it to his editor. And much to his surprise, the wire services pick it up. Before you know it, the entire country is watching the struggle. And all of a sudden, on page one, above the fold, the New York Times, which means it's the very top, Floyd Collins dead in a cave trap on 18th day. Next month in North Carolina, 71 men died in the cave-in. 71 men were in the cave-in and 53 died, and there was no excitement. There was no struggle, no interest. Sensationalism sells papers. There's fads going on. We've got crossword puzzles. We've got mahjong, contract bridge, golf, tennis, bowling, marathons, crazy dance crazes. And of course, in the pulp fiction, we've got Agatha Christie writing. And you have what we call cultural conflicts. Gender, immigration, prohibition, evolution. And each one resulted from some new ways of the common life. In gender, the movement split over the ERA and with the new sexual freedoms. Prohibition, it depended on your class, your national origin, and your religion, uh, how you felt about it. Uh, some were pro, some were con. Uh, some just didn't care one way or the other, but this produces a new class of businessmen called bootleggers. Uh, because where there's a will, there's a way, and the Americans are not going to give up their booze. We had problems with immigration because of something called nativism. We were so afraid of these foreigners coming in that uh, unless you're 100% red, white, and blue and born in this country, we don't want you. Then there's a question of evolution. Uh, it creates complaints in the religious area that religion's going out of style. We're starting to talk about evolving from monkeys. And then it seemed like every time we turned around, we were inundated with new scientific ideas. And when we found out that we were an insignificant satellite circling a sun, and we, you know, we really knew this, but it just, having slapped in the face, we thought we were prime people. And then we discovered the behavior depends on chromosomes. It isn't always environment or who your father was. And psychology became king. Freud and, and you know, it, psychology holds the key to all problems. And the churches are beginning to worry. I mean, God is going out of our lives. And the Protestant church is split. There's one group called the modernists who try to reconcile all these new ideas with religion. Much like Cotton Mather did back in the day when he reconciled the use of the smallpox vaccine with religion. God gave him a brain to think. Then you had the fundamentalists. It's the first time we're going to hear this. And they believe in the total letter of the Bible. Their position, if it's in the Bible, that's the way it's supposed to be. And it flowers in the rural and urban areas. And, uh, and it succeeded through prohibition in reducing alcohol consumption in a lot of places. But, you know, with prohibition, a lot of people thought it was a violation of their rights. The fundamentalists instructed legislation to forbid the teaching of evolution. In Mississippi, Tennessee, and Oklahoma, they were successful. You can only teach the theory of, of creationism. And in Kentucky, we had some problems, too. It was several times it made it through one branch of the house and would not make it through the other one. Billy Sunday, a professional baseball player who became a revivalist preacher, was perhaps the best known of all the fundamentalists. And it's been estimated he preached to as many as 100 million people uh, with messages damning Darwinism and drink. He's perhaps the most well-known. But in Dayton, Ohio, the Scopes Trial, you've probably seen the movies or read the books and heard about it, but let's go over it again. 1925. Uh, the story goes that uh, there were a couple of buddies sitting around at the drugstore in the summertime, uh, drinking lemonade. Because back in the 20s, you, you, you didn't hang out at the mall because there wasn't any malls. You didn't drive around town because you probably didn't have a car or had the money for gas. You went down to the local drugstore, which had these little tables, round tables and little wireback chairs, and a whole row of magazines. And the pharmacist was always telling you, don't read it if you're not going to buy it. So they're drinking sodas or lemonade, and they're talking about how boring it is. And one of the guys asked a young man by the name of John Scopes, 
you, you're a biology teacher. He said, what do you think about this new law say you can't teach evolution in your class? And he said, well, I guess I won't do it. Well, what would happen if you did? He said, well, I'd probably get fired and arrested. Well, what would that do? Well, I don't know. i sure make a little excitement here in Dayton, Tennessee. So he was arrested for violating the state law that prohibited the teaching of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And his trial began to attract, well, shall we say, national attention. It was carried by live radio. And to fundamentalist Christians, the idea that humans had evolved over millions of years from simian ancestors, it contradicted the Bible's account of creation. And to Scope's defenders, including the ACLU, freedom meant the right to independent thought and self-expression. And Tennessee's law showed the dangers of mixing church and state. And the well-known lawyer, Charles Darrell, defended Scopes. And William Jennings Bryan volunteered to first prosecute the trial, which was set for July of 1925. Very strange trial. <laughs> it, families in their wagons, horse-drawn, and the guys with their bib overalls and the mothers with their bonnets on came into town to see what it was all about. Their revivalists showed up, and they're holding meetings on every corner, and there's hot dog vendors, and there's Bible vendors. And more than 100 newsmen filled the court with reporters and cameras. They even had to put in extra lines to carry all the phone lines, all the information over the phone lines out. Evidence. One of the students said, yeah, you know, Scope to tell him about this theory, but it didn't hurt him none. Zoologists testified that life began 600 million years ago. And meanwhile, the news is being telegraphed to England and Switzerland and Italy and Germany and Russia and China and, and Japan. It, it's just almost ridiculous. As a matter of fact, the first day of court, uh, the big news that day was the judge's daughters showed up with their stockings rolled down. You could see their bare legs. Wow. The Attorney General of Tennessee shouts that the doctrine is robbing the Tennessee children of a chance of eternal life. And Attorney Bryant charged Darrow with the only thing he really wanted to do was to slur the Bible. There's Clarence Darrow on the left and William Jennings Bryant on the right. He's the one that was running for president back at the turn of the century. And all of a sudden, William Jennings Bryant was called to stand by Clarence Darrow as an expert witness on the Bible. And it, it's, it's sad. He had an answer for pretty much everything and why the Tower of Babel and, and Noah and the whole bit. But when he came to, where did Cain and Abel get their wives? Well, he, he couldn't answer. And by this time, he's all flustered and hot. It was a very hot day. They got to stand outside the courthouse and under a tree. Finally, the judge calls an end to it and throws out all the testimony. The Scopes lawyer couldn't get any scientific evidence in, and of course, the judge found Scopes guilty and fined him $100. Oh, Brian was very embarrassed. He thought that Darrow was being sarcastic in his interrogation. And actually, Brian died about two weeks after the guilty verdict. But the movement for anti evolution state laws, well, they expired. But of course he was found guilty. He was fined a hundred dollars and they, they took the case to the Tennessee Supreme Court, at least the ACLU did. And what they wanted to do was they wanted the court to rule in favor of the judge and say it was okay. But uh, they, they screwed him up. The Supreme Court <laughs> reversed the ruling. They said that the punishment that had been meted out to Mr. Scopes was unconstitutional. Therefore, the verdict was overturned, and when you have a verdict in your favor, you can't go to the Supreme Court. But the case never got to the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> kind of funny in a way. Like I said, this nativism, it's really starting to bug people. Uh, our, our people, are, our native-born Protestants, are, the, the immigrants are coming in, and, well, it's not good. They, they want 100% Americanism, and these people that are coming in are from Southern Europe. And they managed to get a, a National Origins Act passed in 1924, which we'll get to just in a minute. But the growth of the KKK, it, it popped up in 1915 when Colonel William Sims 
took it over again, and it had been dead for hundreds of years. Well, not hundreds of years, it had been dead since 1969, uh, 1869. And basically what they're doing is they're promoting 100% red, white, and blue. And, and they weren't just against the blacks, they were against the Jews and the Catholics and anyone that was not a native-born American. And the Klan wasn't that active so much in the South, it's more in the Midwest. And it was more blue-collar workers than the redneck from the South. Uh, and one of the largest clans, if you would, was located in the state that's just north of us, uh, called Indiana. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. They were going to save American whitehood. But there were other conflicts. There was a Harlem Renaissance. There was a sexual revolution. The fear of white slavery. And oh my goodness, they were just so afraid that these sweet young things coming to the city to work were going to be grabbed at the train station by these bad guys and kidnapped and turned onto drugs and forced into prostitution. And for the first time ever, we've got more people in the cities than on the farms. And those African Americans are still migrating, still migrating to the north. And of course, more and more local codes to restrict their movements and where they can live. And more and more pressures to restrict immigration. Because these good Protestants are, well, they're fearful of political-based ra radicalism. They did not want these Southern Europeans coming in, uh, you know, the Italians, the Lithuanians, the, the Russians. I mean, they're Catholic, and they're anarchists, and they're Jews. So we wanted to pass, pass a law that would keep them out, but allow the old immigrants, so, you know, like the English and the Irish and the German, they're, they're good people. So we tried to come up with an idea that would be fair, so <laughs> leave it to us. We went back to the 1890 census and saw who all was here, and the massive migration of the Southern Europeans didn't really start till the late 1890s. So they decided to take, according to the census, 2% of the population that was here. So if there was 100,000 Englishmen here, 2% of that could be allowed to come in after 1924. But like I said, there wasn't that many of the Southern Europeans here, so there quota was very small, but we're being fair. It's not just one person. We're letting everybody have the same percentage. Sneaky, huh? Herbert Hoover ran for president and won by a pretty good majority. He won by writing on the prosperity of the decade. But on October the 29th, 1929, soon to be known as Black Tuesday, the stock market crashed. A panic ensued, and in five hours, more than $10 million, billion dollars in market value disappeared. And the U.S. quickly found herself in the Great Depression, the greatest economic calamity in modern history. There were some signals that were being missed. Southern California and Florida had experienced spectacular real estate booms and busts and it resulted in bank failures and foreclosures because at this time, the banks only operated on the money that they had. But stocks momentarily rebounded because we had some uh, millionaires who went and said, we can't have this happen. They started buying up stock at higher than the, the prices. But they soon reserved, resumed their precipitous decline. It didn't last. 11 million workers out of work. 25% of our labor force. Our gross national product is going down. Those who had jobs faced reduced wages and hours. And every industrial economy suffered. But the United States was hit the hardest and lasted the longest. Thousands take to the road to find work. They stood in bread lines. They erected shack cities called Hoovervilles for the president. And they reversed immigration or migration. Instead of the people coming from the farms to the cities, now they're going back to this farm trying to find some little piece of ground somewhere to grow some food. The suicide rate rose in the highest in American history. The birth rate dropped to its lowest. Marriages were postponed. And the public image of the big business in Wall Street, uh, well, was shown to have thrived on shady dealings and the sale of worthless bonds. 
a lot of Americans blame themselves. You know, it's, it's bad when you want to work, you can't find a job. Some responded with protest. The unions and the socialists were devastated in the early 1920s and they couldn't help. And the cities very quickly ran out of any type of relief funds because we didn't have federal help. And the veterans marched on Washington for a bonus. And yeah, they weren't trying to cause any problems. They were promised a bonus. There were World War I veterans. And they were promised a bonus, but it wasn't due to be paid until 1945. But these men were unemployed and they needed it now. So they set up shacks on the White House lawn. And before you know it, the president does the most stupid thing he could do. He calls out the army to disperse them. And in the 19, late 1920s, I mean, we have film, remember? And it was all caught on film, and the public saw it, and we could not believe that our president had ordered force used against our veterans. Well, it's because of that he lost the election, and we had a new president come in called Theodore Roosevelt. The Communist Party seemed to be only the group that even tried to help. Of course, the businesses opposed any type of federal assistance to the people. And Hoover's reassurances that the economy was recovering, we called it job owning. And it clashed with reality, because he, he seemed to be ignorant of problems facing the ordinary Americans. It kind of reminds me a little bit when President Bush number one tried to go shopping and he, he didn't have any money, didn't have any credit cards, and he didn't know anything about those machines where you scan your stuff when you take it across. And he raised the tariffs. And, of course, the other nations retaliated. They raised theirs, so our international trade dropped. He placed a tax on citizens to try to balance the budget, and all he did was reduce the consumer buy buying power, so you got less taxes coming in. But he did do some things. He uh, recreated the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and he gave money to failing banks and the railroads. He vetoed bills to create unemployment, uh, because he didn't want the government to be the, an employer. He approved $2 billion to aid the unemployed, and no more. Any more would be a disservice to the jobless, because they would depend upon it. Well, some of us are worried, you know, has America accepted limits on free speech and suppression of civil liberties because of this? Now, this 1920s prosperity on the outside had encouraged laissez-faire government hands-off. But now, depression and Hoover's failed responses, it, it seems to discredit the decade altogether. Now, I have 11 things listed here. Are there warning signs that were not taken? And they've all been mentioned. 40% uh, of families live below the poverty level. And like I said, it, 2,000 was considered enough for a family of four. Wages fell because prosperity is bypassing certain groups like women, African Americans, Hispanics. Farm prices are depressed. Uh, we've got high tariffs and, and the other well, places like Australia and Argentina, they learned how to grow their own stuff. They don't need ours anymore. And of course, with farm prices being, farm prices being depressed, the farmers can't make any money and buy new things. They can't pay their loans. So when the farmer can't pay his loan to the banks, pretty soon the banks fail. Now, okay, you own a small business and you're doing good. You're making money and you're putting money in the bank every week. But when the bank closes its doors and falls, uh, you, you lose your money because there is no insurance. And the consumers around the country had huge, huge amounts of credit being owed. Business investments are declining. And one of the things we use nowadays, as well as back then, is they use the rate of new home construction to judge how the economy is going. And I have been building refrigerators like crazy because on the first couple of years, everybody wanted one, but now everybody's got one. And they, how many refrigerators do you need? So I have to store the ones I have made and lay off the workers I don't need to make anymore. So I've got excessive inventory, so it means layoffs. Then the Federal Reserve did something rather stupid. They, they slowed the money supply and raised tariffs. Not very smart. Those 11 things would be good to remember. But did all that cause a depression? Could it have been avoided and could it happen again? 
think about it. Rhetorical question. If you had been president, how would you have handled it? Hmm. So we come to the end of the chapter. I have another little YouTube or two to show you. And uh, thank you for listening.